that happens to forestry people. They spend too much time in the woods. Okay, I just hit start. Welcome everybody. Um, it is Thursday, August 20th. We're holding our Gila County University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Garden and Web Country Web Extension Webinar Series. Today, I've got Terry Gorton, who's going to speak about lavender agritourism in Arizona, bringing new life to a pioneer farm. Just a little bit about these webinars. Um, I hold these weekly um, by Zoom. They're 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11. We feature a variety of horticulture and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County and any place else that's of interest. Um, I put a recording of this at the uh, University of Arizona Gila County Extension website. So that's the link right there, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. Um, you'll be able to find the upcoming presentations at, at there, as well as the, uh, the archives of the, of, of the programs. The uh, University of Arizona is an equal opportunity, affirmative action institution. Our agenda today, thank you for those of you who joined on early. You're able to hear Terry and I talk in a little, little shop. Um, I'm your moderator, Chris Jones. Our title is uh, Lavender Agritourism in Arizona bringing new life to a pioneer farm with Terry Gordon. She's gonna have about a half an hour. We're going to um, have some brief updates and that evaluation link, I already put that into the, uh, the chat box. I really appreciate people taking the time to fill out that evaluation. It only takes about a minute or two for me. We'll have a question and answer period and can have a little open discussion depending on how that goes and we'll seek to wrap up by noon. Here is our uh, presenter, Terry Gorton Veshi. She is the Pine Creek Canyon Lavender Farm proprietor, but she has another life, and I'm just really honored to be with her right now. Let me just read her bio if you let me. Terry Gorton Veshi is the former Assistant Resource Secretary, Secretary for the State of California and past USA General Counsel for Worsall International, a leading worldwide solar developer. Terry has served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Sustainability, California State, and Regional Community Economic Revitalization Teams, the Tahoe Conservancy, and Chair of the California Fire Strategy Commission. Ms. Gordon is a practicing California, California attorney and served as Governor Pete Wilson's legal and campaign counsel as the first and only women, woman to chairman of the California Board of Forestry, the nation's oldest environmental board. Former board member of Lean, L-E-A-N Energy US. She has received numerous awards, including the National Performance Review Award presented by the Office of the Vice President of the United States and the US Rural Economic Development Award. She has been featured in Cosmopolitan Magazine, Arizona Highways Magazine, Good Morning Arizona, Travel and Leisure Magazine, San Diego Magazine as a Woman to Watch, and the Los Angeles Times and Wall Street Journal. So, wow. Thank wow. you, Terry. And she's just really easy to get along with, too. Right. And, and so this is just great. So, Terry, I'm going to change the slides here and start ours. Okay, well, hello to everybody out there in lavender loving land. And I'm so happy to have you join us here at Pine Creek Canyon Lavender Farm this morning. It's a really nice day up here in Pine. I'm sure it's a lot cooler than it is in the Phoenix, greater Phoenix Valley. And um, the picture that you're seeing right now, we were so privileged. The official um, Office of Arizona Tourism is doing a movie about us, and we'll have to keep you up to date with that, Chris. But that's a picture of us the day we were harvesting some lavender about a month ago. And you can see I'm holding a bundle of lavender that we had just cut, and look at the length of that lavender. Our lavender this year has been absolutely beautiful. It's my sweet and darling husband, Rick, by my side, and that's our welcome. 
So the picture that you're seeing now is an aerial shot of our farm this year. And it has been so beautiful. And if you can distinguish a little bit of different coloration of some of those lavenders, I'm gonna walk you through today the over 5,300 lavender plants that we have on the farm today. Um, we're gonna talk about the three varieties, both culinary and non-culinary, and a lot about the growing conditions and perhaps products you can make out of lavender. And of course, if you're interested in some agritourism ventures, I'm gonna give you some tips. You know, we bought this farm. It had been abandoned for about 47 years. And every time I drove by, I just said, oh, honey, we should buy that property. And it had been tied up in a lot of um, the conversation amongst a very big family who were all heirs to the farm. And eventually they just decided that they would just put the property up for sale. And so we jumped on it as quick as we could and were fortunate enough to be the ones, the first ones outside the original pioneer family, the Hunt family, who were one of five families that settled Pine. And the original farm was about 80 acres. Well, we were sitting one evening, we have wonderful water here at the farm. We have the original Pine Creek ditch water, which the farmers put in way back in the 40s, and it came with our property when we bought it. And so we were sitting by our ditch watching the water flow by, and I said, you know, honey, we should really grow something. We have land, we have water. Let's, let's grow something. Let's be farmers. <laughs> and Rick quick on his feet said, uh, but what about the elk? And this little dandy that you see peering through our lower fields, one of about 200 that maraunder through our property on probably a weekly basis, in those lower fields behind that elk, there's a, a big pond and of course all that wonderful grass and it's in the repairing corridor of Pine Creek. Um, she decided that she was gonna come and visit along with another 70 or 80 of her friends. One of the things that became very important was what to do about the elk. If any of you have gardened in this area where elk are, they can push down, knock down, get through almost anything. So all I did was run in the house, pull up Google and ask what don't elk eat. And lavender was top amongst, especially the merchantable products or plants that elk won't eat. And that's really what our business plan started with, what elk won't eat. And so we started on our journey. The first winter was a little bit rough. This is what the house looked like when we purchased the property. The, most of the windows were broken out in the front. Um, the old fireplace had collapsed. Now, you can see the chimney left over from the old wood cook stove, which um, the kids had taken when the last of the Randalls continued to live here in the hunt. And so it was a pretty rugged first winter. We were certainly looking forward to spring when we could start planting our lavender. As spring came, we began with bulldozing, shaping our land. Uh, you can still see the house in this picture, very much not like that beautiful red classic farmhouse it is today, but it was a work in progress. And like I said, it had been abandoned for about 47 years. You can see that what we needed to do first was shape the land. Important to lavender is how the drainage works. And so we started by um, by shaping the land, we brought in a tremendous amount of decomposed granite and sand into these upper, more level areas, something we didn't need to do, thankfully, on our sloping hillsides. But you can see the old, uh, original 1890 log structure that's there in your slide. And that actually was um, built as a storage uh, facility right from the beginning. And today we use it for our, one of our drying barns. And behind that, you can see sticking up, that was a water tower storage building. And those of course are still here on the farm today and something that our visitors and hopefully you can come and look at in the future. The next thing that we needed to do was really groom and put in our water lines. 
You can see a little bit again here, that's that same log cabin. And you're gonna see that a number of times in today's slide. So if you've been to the farm, it sits directly behind our farm store. And if you haven't been, well, of course, we hope to see you in the future, but that will give you a reference point for where that is on our farm. So we're putting in extensive water line systems to deliver to the 5,300 lavender plants that we have on order as spring arrives. Next thing we had to do really was start planting. And I'm gonna tell you a really quick and beautiful story. So here in Pine, of course, it's a kind of a small community. We have a friend here and I said, okay, so we're so excited, we're gonna go and get our lavender plants. She said, well, me and my friend, Sherry, would love to come over and help you. And I said, oh gosh, thank you. And she said, you know, there's several people here in town. Let me send a couple of emails out. Well, 25 people showed up the next day to help us plant 5,300 lavender plants. So we got it done all in one day. And whenever I see any of those rows that are a little bit crooked, it just warms my heart because I think of all those people that came. And now what we do is we have an annual harvest event. They're all still invited back. We just put on a big barbecue for them. And it's a really, really fun way that the community has been knit together around the lavender farm. In fact, that group is now up to about 60 people. So as you see, we're starting to plant. You can see our drip lines. And now you see the plants actually in the ground in the big part of the field. We used slit tape for actually our first two years. Slit tape is a really, really great agricultural product when you have the number of plants that we do. In fact, I even like it in my, in my home vegetable garden. But the problem with slit tape for us is that although the elk doesn't, don't eat the lavender, they love to jump into the field and sort of just look around, <laughs> just menace us generally, but we love them. And so we this year have gone to a hard pipe with um, built-in emitters in hopes that as the deer, the elk wander through our fields, they don't rip the tape up like they have in the past. But this is how small those baby little lavender plugs were when we first started planting. Um, then the next thing I want to show you is what that same shot looks like today. So if you can see on the far, far left of your slide, there's the roof of that uh, log cabin. So you can see how big and vibrant and just this lavender was four years old in May. You saw in May uh, actually, that was the date of those little tiny baby plugs and the planting. So this was four years later. We managed to get enough time to paint the house, fix it up, put in new windows, do all kinds of remodeling. And by the way, our farm and our house and a number of those outbuildings are all original pioneer buildings. And we have been um, accepted with the Arizona State Historical Office of Preservation and we're hoping that by the year end, we will be on the National Register of Historic Places. So once we got all this beautiful lavender growing, we decided that we needed to really um, create a store and create sort of a legacy around it. And so many people that come to our farm wanna know about the soil and water conditions so that they can go home and plant lavender. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now about what lavender likes. So lavender is a plant that is semi-arid. There's about, depending on which authority you read, two to three, four thousand varieties that have been around throughout history. In fact, in the Bible, the reference to spikenard is actually believed to be lavender. And as some of you may know, Jesus was actually buried in spikenard or entombed in spikenard. So it's had quite a history for a long time. Lavender really originated in Mediterranean areas. It likes those kind of arid, sort of drier conditions. Although we see lavender being extremely, extremely popular now more and more throughout the United States and some of the Northern areas, 
Michigan is becoming a big lavender growing state. And of course, Washington state up near Squam was where lavender really got its first foothold in the US. Now, one thing I wanna say about Squam is that it's in the rain shadow of the Olympic um, range. So they actually receive less water than we do here in Pine, Arizona. A lot of people say, well, wait a minute, it grows so well, we've been up to Squam, we've seen all those great lavender farms, but please take note that that actually is quite a dry area, even though it is Washington state. So alkaline conditions, the key, we believe, to great lavender growing. Soil needs to be alkaline, and the water, if at all possible, needs to be alkaline. You can easily have your water tested or do it yourself for alkalinity. We, of course, water directly out of Pine Creek, um, that ditch water I talked to you about earlier. And it is quite alkaline and full of all kinds of natural you know, minerals and fertilizers. And so it's a fabulous watering system for lavender. If you have well water or even your house city water, just make sure to keep an eye on your lavender that you don't um, have a water that is so acid that it's really going to hurt your plants. Now I talked about soil alkalinity. Think sand, think decomposed granite, even clay. Um, and so those are great soil types that we have here in Arizona in lots of places for the varieties that we grow, which I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute. But the other thing you've got to, got to, got to, and I say that three times because it's that important, you've got to make sure that your soils are all extremely well drained. Whether you're putting your lavender like in a great you know, whiskey barrel or in the ground, that soil around them has to be extremely well drained. Lavender hates to have its feet wet. In hot areas like the valley, we find um, with our customers that lavender absolutely will grow. We recommend north side of your house or someplace in the shade. You can see in our fields, we have lavender growing under big shade trees and it does extremely well. So you don't need to worry about the intensity uh, of the sunlight. And you'll see that in a lot of books that will say, it must be in full sun. Don't believe it for a minute. <laughs> Ours doesn't need full sun and produces fabulous flowers. Um, so in the valley, make sure you guard against overly cooking your plants in the ground. And water, but make sure that water runs right on through. In fact, there's a lot of problems with lavender commercial farms when um, conditions get too wet. We lost about 300 plants the second year during an extremely vibrant monsoon, which of course we wish we had right now, um, because we just could not control in our lower field, there's a very, very low spot in a corner and it just stayed too wet for too long. So be sure and guard against that. Alkaline soil, alkaline water if you can get it, and well-drained soil. Don't go out and buy the finest potting soil that you can get put your wonderful little lavender plant in it and water it profusely like you're growing a tomato, you'll kill it. So anyway, and I'll take questions about that later. So anyway, I wanna talk for a minute about bees and about butterflies. If you have lavender around, you will not believe the bees will come from miles around. We've been told, although we don't know, but we've been told that the bees will travel at least four miles to come to our lavender fields. There are literally millions and millions of them in our fields as a lavender is ripening. As there are butterflies, we have dozens and dozens of varieties of butterflies. In fact, a um, professor from the University of Arizona who specializes in biodynamic environments, I think she said, said that our little acre and a half here of our front lavender field is the most diverse of any place in northern Arizona in terms of the bees and butterfly activity and other little critters that are flitting around. Which brings me to the subject of who doesn't like lavender? Well, most bugs don't like lavender. Most rodents don't like lavender. Scorpions don't like lavender. Snakes don't like lavender. It's really kind of a cool thing because no matter how dense our fields are out there, I'm never worried about shuffling into a rattlesnake or something. And we do sell a lot of our trimmings 
to people that want to ring their house or their patio or have a back porch that they want to scatter lavender all around the edges to help prevent the invasion of rodents. And I think it must work pretty well, certainly in my back porch where I store a lot of things and there's plenty of holes given that it was built in 1907. I just don't get the invasions coming in. So I think lavender is really, really a great, great plant to have around. And the flies tend to stay away. I don't think it's proof against flies. We do have a few, but we also have horses and all kinds of other things that draw them in. So who knows, but plant lavender. Um, when we decided on the varieties of lavender, it was really a no brainer for me. I love to cook. And you might see that we have a Bob's Red Mill sponsored uh, lavender cooking and baking school. And I've taught those kinds of classes a lot during my career. I had an amazing granny that taught me all of those things and I just really, really enjoy it. Um, in fact, if you subscribe to our website, uh, once a month I send out a free lavender culinary recipe so that you can start cooking with lavender too because it is super healthy. Anyway, we decided to do two thirds of our total lavender uh, farm crop in culinary lavender. I think we might be one of the biggest culinary lavender farms in the state. Certainly we make more culinary lavender products. Um, but English lavenders, and ours in particular, Royal Velvet, is a real favorite of mine. All English lavenders fall under the Angustifolia genus, whereas a number of the other lavenders you'll probably recognize like Provence and um, uh, Edelweiss and stuff are actually intermediates, they're crosses. But Royal Velvet is just a darling of a little lavender. You can probably see it's the dark blue lavender that I have sitting right to my side. And if you look at the, the um, slide, you see Royal Velvet is that one right up on the top. It's just a beautiful, almost royal purple color. Lovely, lovely, lovely little lavender. Makes the sweetest, actually considered by most chefs as a confectionery lavender. You know, if you're going to make lavender ice cream, lavender sugar, uh, I use it almost exclusively in my lavender teas and those lavender scones that are so delicious, lavender whipped cream, all kinds of fudges. Oh my gosh, I can go on and on. Our most popular, our lavender cinnamon rolls, all start with that lavender up on the top, English Royal Velvet. And we are a certified naturally grown farm. So we use no pesticides, herbicides, chemicals of any kind. In fact, so far the elk are quite frankly doing a wonderful job of sort of dispersing natural fertilizers through our field. The middle one, lavender that you're seeing, kind of that silvery blue uh, lavender, that is French Provence. And Provence is a uh, intermediate lavender. It's a wonderful, probably the most uh, widely used lavender throughout the world, especially in Mediterranean regions for culinary purposes. Herbs de Provence, that'll always have Provence lavender in it. Big surprise there. And it's a wonderful lavender for roasting meats, for adding those kinds of really heartier flavors. Um, we use it when we make our uh, infused lavender honey uh, because we find it has a really robust flavor to stand up against uh, the strength of honey. So it really balances it beautifully. The flavor profiles are very lavendery sweet and go a little towards maybe a hint of camphor like you would see in a rosemary. We use it in our all of our pepper and our heavier herb blend combinations because it's just a great lavender to deliver that flavor. And then the final variety that we grow is Grosso. And Grosso is a very tall plant. It's a great, great one for you if you're not looking for culinary lavender. Grosso is a really, really great plant to to consider. Grosso is very hardy, grows a wide range of conditions, and it's what uh, most of the essential oil is made from around the world. Although there's other hybrids that are coming in pretty strong, but particularly in Provence, if you've been there, you'll see a lot of Grosso lavender growing. And we use Grosso here a lot for um, 
like that picture that you saw me in in the beginning, those beautiful long stem bouquets. We sell a lot of it for weddings. We sell a lot of it to florists for bouquets. And we sell a lot of it directly to customers in the store when we're open, <laughs> which we are temporarily closed because of coronavirus, hoping to open in the not too distant future. But it is just a great, great variety to stick in a jug, put it next to your bed, you know, I have several customers who buy it and they hang it upside down in their showers and kind of pinch a few buds every time they step in the shower to bring kind of a little personal aromatherapy into their lives. So those are the three varieties of lavender that we grow here at the farm. Um, if you are interested, long about the first week, sometimes the second week in July every year, we do a big harvest event. And you can see that's actually, um, I think that is some Grosso lavender that we have just cut. And it's um, just getting ready to be bundled. When we harvest our lavender, we take a big handful, just like you see in this picture, cut it off, and then we tie either a twist tie around it or a rubber band around it. And you can see in the next slide that we throw those down. This is the most amazing scene, I have to tell you. It's one of my favorites. As we go through the fields, because we're going very, very fast, we're cutting and bundling in the fields, and we drop those down on the plants. You can see underneath all that green plant, that actually is the uh, lavender bush where we have just cut the flowers from. And so we... We bundle those lavenders and either stick on our certified naturally grown um, zip ties if we're gonna sell those directly in the store, or sometimes we put just rubber bands around them if we're gonna go straight into the drying barn uh, to be dried to make culinary products out of them. But this is just a gorgeous scene to see all of those vibrant green plants with those beautiful purple bundles on top of them. It's quite a scene. So if you're around our area, first, second week of July, sometimes it extends to the third week. Of course, we're farmers, it's weather dependent. <laughs> um, but be sure and at least drive by and see our fields when they're being harvested because you can smell that lavender for half a mile around. So the next slide you see is our lavender that has been picked up. Um, this obviously is a little bit different because you can see all of these have rubber bands around them. So all this lavender is in our drying barn. This is one of our drying barns. We have three actually right now. Um, and we do just exactly this to dry the lavender plants. We cut them, we put those little rubber band around them and a real high-tech system. We take paper clips and twist them open and then we hang them up on these screens. You can use, um, you know, just a clothesline or whatever you have. If you have a place that you want to dry some lavender that you're growing and be sure and hang it uh, where it's going to get lots of airflow around it. And you'll see that the lavender actually will drop a bunch of, um, it's flowers on the floor and you'll think, oh my gosh, what's going on here? But what you're really after are those tiny little unopened buds and they will stick tight as tight can be to your lavender flowers. So don't worry about when the little tips of the flowers fall onto the floor when you're drying your lavender. And make sure you leave them until the lavender is perfectly dry. And it really depends on weather conditions and wind conditions. So that lavender stayed in my drying barn about three weeks this year. Usually I might leave it a month or two months, but we had a lot of pretty warm winds. And as you all know, very hot weather this year. So as soon as those get dry, and I test their dryness by just squeezing the buds between my fingers kind of down into the middle of the plant. And if they just come off in my hands pretty easily and feel real dry and stiff, I know they're dry. And then I'll pack them in clean new boxes. And usually I'll leave the lids open on the box. But again, you know, we're dealing with thousands of bundles. So if you're doing it for a few plants that you have at home, you can just keep your eyes on them, you know, every few days to make sure that they're 
nice and dry. And when they're ready, either put them in vases, don't put them in water. Once they're dry, those uh, stems will act almost like a little pipette and pull water straight up into the buds and they'll start to mold right away. So once they're dry, don't ever wet them again, but set them around the house and just enjoy them. When they get a little dry or discolored, debud them for um, sachets or something that you want to make out of them. And in fact, I'm going to give you a little demonstration right now about how to debud lavender. So you have this wonderful lavender that you have dried, and it's going to look something like this. And if you're not going to put it in a vase, I've got these sitting all over my house, beautiful dried vases of all kinds full of lavender. But if you want to make some products from your lavender, especially like some wonderful sachets for your you know, linen chest or for your lingerie drawer um, and for gifts, they're just so, so welcome as gift. Take your dried lavender. Again, you can see that this lavender is nice and dry. And then this is really how we do it here. There are machines, and I think maybe next year we might get a machine. So I just took out the little paper clip that I was using to hang this in our drying barn. And then I have a nice big bowl. My hands are washed and clean. And this is Provence. So this is a culinary lavender. So I want to make sure I do everything just clean as a whistle. And can you see how as I go like that, the lavender buds just rain down. And I just keep going through this lavender. I did about 100 of these this morning, by the way, ladies. And then I kind of open it a little bit. And you can hopefully see that I'm still getting some of the flowers that were way up kind of near that rubber band. And then kind of go towards the end here and pull the rest of those buds off. Now what I have are lavender sticks. And these sticks actually we sell, I told you the aforementioned uh, uses for repelling bugs and slugs and scorpions and stuff. But they're also wonderful as fire starters. They're really pretty. I use a lot of these in fall decor to mix with you know, pumpkins and fall leaves and things like that. They're so gorgeous. Um, they're also really great to cut. Use the stems alone, tightly bundled with sage for room clearing. We have a lot of friends too that are barbecuers and they love this. Think lavender instead of, say for example, applewood. Soaking these and adding these to your smoke for barbecue is really great too. But look at this beautiful bowl that I got just out of that one head of lavender. And then I need to go through, and if I have a few little stems or something, I certainly clean those out. And for my culinary lavender, I'm really, really fussy about cleaning all of those little stems out because I don't want that heavier camphor flavor profile that's in the stem to get too strong in the food products that I'm making. So, Let's talk for a minute about ways that we can use lavender. So lavender is gotta be right up there with um, coconut as being one of the most useful plants on the planet. You know, there's a number of really, really great resources. And as an attorney, of course, I really like facts. So I've done a lot of research in the published medical and other research, professional research journals about what recent findings are coming down about lavender. Certainly colloquially, we have known through the holistic community, lavender helps you relax, lavender helps you sleep, lavender relieves certain pain. But I will tell you, the University of Maryland Medical Center started really the ball rolling several years ago when they did one of the largest samplings by a renowned medical institute on lavender. And their findings came down pretty specifically. One, 
lavender is the number one, according to them, topical treatment for alopecia and for hair. So unless it's pattern baldness, hair loss from chemotherapy, uh, hormone changing, from stress, from all kinds of um, other factors that create hair loss, unless it's pattern baldness, we sell a serum here at the farm to really, really revive those um, hair cells on the roots and really help your hair get going again. In fact, I had to do some, a little facial chemotherapy and lost like a third of my hair. And that was when really got busy and said, you know what, um, we gotta do something. I know this about lavender. So we got with Cindy from Windy Hill Lavender and uh, now sell this beautiful uh, lavender hair serum. And it really, really is fantastic. Although a caution, Lavender actually is known to trigger the release of the hormone estrogen. So I always caution my ladies that if they have breast cancer or other cancers that are um, estrogen derived to be really careful and consult with a doctor. The other thing about lavender that the University of Maryland Medical Center um, found was that it was great for burns. Lavender is actually a topical analgesic it is an antibacterial, antimicrobial, and antiviral. And it also is a cellular regenerator. That's probably why it works so well as a hair treatment, hair loss treatment. So they came out and said that actually lavender essential oil should be being used in all burn units in the hospital settings throughout America. It's that effective. And then we see them going on to recommend lavender for bee bites, stings, minor abrasions, even going as far as saying certain conditions that uh, skin conditions such as um, rosacea and even mild impetigo and some of those things, wait, impetigo, maybe that's the wrong thing, <laughs> that it's really um, has been shown to be useful in clinical treatments. We, of course, make lavender salves and you know, have all kinds of lavender products that we sell here at the farm um, to kind of highlight those uses for what a lot of the leading me medical uh, researchers are saying is this second wave of awareness of lavender as a real powerhouse in our medical uh, chests. One of the other things about lavender, of course, is sleep and relaxation. And I'm going to refer you to, and I think Chris put is, has a link for you, of the uh, Behavior and Neurological Sciences, a study done in October of 2018 about lavender's effect on the brain. And lavender, they found amazed as a lawyer that a doctor would say this, that lavender is shown to be um, in their initial animal trials as effective as the group of drugs of uh, theo by it. <laughs> theo, in, ah, can't say it. Anyway, but the Valium drugs. <laughs> and so it's really, really being touted. And in fact, they went on to say that Dr. Heideki that he expected within the next 10 years to see lavender as really being the first line uh, of treatment, pre-dental and pre-surgical procedures to help relax patients without adding another stress load of chemicals into the system that of course are gonna then have questionable mixing with the sedatives and other things that are also pumped into our bodies during uh, surgeries and stuff. So we really, really uh, are keeping a close eye on all of this wonderful information coming down about lavender. So we make a plethora of products, everything from lotions and creams and super moisturizing lotion bars. We have a product called a socks pack that combines a um, kind of a latex impregnated sock with our super moisturizing lotion bar to correct those dry heels because I have such a hard time because I love to go barefoot. But we have hair serums, we have pillow sprays, which you've probably all heard, you know, lavender linen spray. That's actually something called hydrosol. It's the water that goes through the process of making essential oil. And at the very end, you have this beautiful floral smelling water. And that's what is sold worldwide as uh, 
linen spray because you can use it with impunity on your face, any place on your skin, of course, on your pillows, pet beds, in your cars, anywhere. But because it has no oil, it's not going to stain. We do make uh, lavender face masks here at the farm. And they are just beautiful. We have three layers in them, two cotton layers of a really, really pretty lavender print and an interfacing of polyester, actually just as recommended by the CDC for high quality face masks. And so you'll want to check them out. And along with our new product, you can see that lavender face mask mist. Remember my telling you that lavender is an antibacterial, antiviral, antimicrobial. So we combine lavender with several other items and package these with our face masks and you can find them online and it makes your face mask have this wonderful smell. We do a lavender, lavender and peppermint and lavender and eucalyptus, which I think is gonna be very popular as the weather starts to turn cool, but it really makes these face masks so much more wearable and adds those added benefits of lavender's superpowers uh, to your face mask. Um, we also do a lot of culinary products here at the farm. And you can check out, of course, all of these things at our website, uh, which you see on your screen. And we do offer free shipping over $29, so you can uh, get all of your favorite products. But here you'll see some of the things, in fact, in the recent article um, at Arizona Highways, if you're an Arizona Highways subscriber or love Arizona Highways, we are in the September issue of Arizona Highways this month. And they do talk a lot about our uh, culinary items. I think we're very unique. Uh, we have, and all of the culinary items are made right here on the farm, except I do have that cocoa compact for me uh, because of some guidelines. So we make uh, lavender salts, lavender peppers, all kinds of lavender teas from lavender and chamomile, which let me tell you, if you want a knockout tea, that's, that's your go-to between chamomile's wonderful relaxing properties and those properties of lavender, it is wonderful. We make lavender mint, we make a lavender fall spice starting in the fall, a lavender earl gray is a wonderful tea. It goes with those lavender scones you're going to be baking. Our lavender cocoa, people rave about it for putting in their coffee, for making lavender mocha. Super, super popular. Um, we teach all kinds of classes here at the Pine Creek Canyon Lavender Farm School. And I'm going to show you a couple of the things. Oh, but first, Piper Cub. This is Pine Creek Canyon Piper Cub. And he's showing off here by having stolen one of my masks and put it on just, just I think to get attention. I think he looks cute though. Anyway, and he's also standing in that middle slide by some of the, um, the products that we make for animals. Lavender is just as wonderful and great for our four legged family friends. So we make a lavender shampoo, a lavender pooch spray, which we actually have talked to our vets about too. Lavender really will help calm your pets down. Now, I wanna make a distinction here. I have a dog, a Belgian Malinois of ours, that's terrified of big lightning thunderstorms. There's no amount of lavender that's gonna make her not be afraid. But if you've got that dog that's uncomfortable in the car or nervous Nelly about this or that, a lavender pooch spray is a really, really great product to have available to you. It's also great on pet beds, although it does have lavender essential oil in it. So it will, um, you know, put oil onto the bed too. But that's what we use. It's really great. And we make a fabulous lavender uh, bug spray. It's combined with a number of other all natural ingredients. And it's really great. I use it on my horses all the time. Uh, I never put those poison sprays on my horses anymore. And I think it's just as effective, if not more effective. And we sell hundreds and hundreds to all of our fellow hikers out here too. And they've taken it everywhere from the rainforest in the Pacific Northwest to Alaska, to even the rainforest down in South America too, and given us rave reviews about its effectiveness. So we do have that full span of products that we make from our great lavender. Now, a couple of things 
about our cooking school. I think I told you it's Bob's Red Mill sponsored cooking school. Every year, of course this year is so strange, but every year I do release six months worth of classes at a time. If you're a subscriber on our website, you get those classes first. And I always give our subscribers and fellow students, former students, a couple of weeks to pick the classes that they want. We usually sell out almost immediately in all of the classes. I only take 10 is why. <laughs> uh, but um, I think you, if you're interested in being a lavender cook, you will love our classes. We do everything from the ever popular cinnamon rolls to um, lavender roasted salmon and all kinds of things in between. Lavender brownies, lavender, I just made some lavender plum balsamic vinegar uh, not in a class, but for myself, that you can bet it's going to be in a class coming in the future because it's fantastic. So we use our 1907 kitchen as our classroom you saw there. And that's also a bunch of ladies that are lined up in front of our store. They had come up and bought a bunch of products and wanted a picture taken in front of the store. You can see our cute little purple uh, umbrellas and happy shoppers. And I want to give you a couple of slides and we're going to give you a recipe too for one of our lavender lemon cookies. Those lavender lemon cookies were featured on Good Morning Arizona. They're super delicious. And uh, I think you would love that. And of course, lavender brownies. Lavender chocolate brownies, you, you just cannot go wrong. So those brownies are made using our lavender sugar. I actually took pecans and roasted them with some lavender sugar. So inside the brownies are lavender sugar pecans in the brownies, and then I dusted them with some of our lavender sugar on top, and they are fabulous. So I hope that you will try some of the recipes. Please join us anytime for a class. Please come and visit the farm. It's super beautiful. And I hope you've really enjoyed this talk today, learned a lot. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Oh, boy, that was great, Terry. That was a lot of information and a lot of useful information and also just going to your, the day that you're able to open and we're able to go there and buy some things and have our, our uh, shops. Um, Terry mentioned a couple of uh, resources that I'm going to be posting her, um, her presentation to my website, and I'll also have that recipe for the, uh, for the cookies and that information, some of the health benefits of it. So we're gonna turn over to some of the questions. Um, I've got a few in the Q&A to start with. And so Sh Carolyn Shelley asks, do you distill your lavender to use in products? And how about hydrosol? Is that available in your store? Um, Uh-oh, Chris, can't hear you very good. Oh, do you distill and how about hydrosol? Okay, got it, I can see these now. Okay, um, you know, we this year distilled some of our Grosso lavender and we're, we really like it and it turned out just crazy. And I, I haven't started marking it, bottling it and labeling it marketing yet, but we think because we harvested late because of the movie that was being made here, we wound up getting a lot of bee pollen somehow. And in our hydrosol, it smells like lavender honey hydrosol. So it is just amazing. And I'm gonna have that available pretty soon. And then is, that a, is the hydrosol available in our store? Absolutely. So we sell the hydrosol as lavender mist, we call it in our store. And it is, um, we have both a, a tall eight ounce bottle and we have a small bottle. And those are both available on our website and here at the store. Uh, if you need big, big quantities of hydrosol for some reason, give me a call. Um, I'm at, um, easily found at pine lavender farm at gmail.com another question here do you mulch between the rows from donna is that the where do you purchase your plants no no from from the do you mulch oh so mulch. mulching between the plants. mulch is that right mulch 
<laughs> I, can't, I can't hear it very good. Anyway, I think you're asking about mulch. So mulch is a really, really tricky and much debated issue amongst commercial lavender growers. A lot of people like to use the weed mulch or the weed cloth in between their lavender rows. We weed by hand and it is a pain to weed 50, 300 plants all by hand. But um, we visit a lot of farms where they're using weed cloths and weed mulches. Um, you know, I just don't know. I, because the growing conditions and things can be different. We get tremendous yields. We get two, sometimes three crops a year. And we think lavender really kind of doesn't like a whole lot of suppression around its roots. The other thing we do is every year we start at the top of the field and Rick washes 5,300 plants. He goes out with a garden hose and washes around the base of the plant where the plant and the earth come together to kind of keep all of that garbage away from, you know, all the, you know, the dried buds and any weeds that have gone in there and anything that kind of builds up the soil during the big rains. So, so mulch is, is, is a contested issue, I would have to say that. We don't mulch any of our lavender. Um, I have had some lavender plants in pots and when we went away for a week, I threw some mulch on top of them just to hold the soil mo moisture, but then I pulled it away after. To go in those big, beautiful fields um, in France, and you can see grass growing for miles between those, those rows, and then some others will be completely bare. So I just don't know. I don't have a good answer, but I know if you get it too wet and keep it wet, which of course is one of the beauties of mulch, you're gonna have problems with your lavender. The other hand, keeps out the weeds. I'm gonna let you decide. Okay. Um, Carol Kiefer, I think you saw this in the question and answer. Where do you purchase your lavender plants? So Carol, we purchase our lavender plants from Mike Teeples over at Red Rock Lavender. So Red Rock Lavender is in Concho here in Arizona. He is a, a, a very large grower, great people over there. And he um, has an annual lavender festival too, usually that last week in June and first week or two in July, if you wanna take in a lavender festival. Uh, we just don't have the parking availability, but that's Red Rock Lavender. And he does, um, I, I know when you go to the festival, you can buy a few plants at a time I think he primarily sells wholesale, um, but great, great place to start. There's also Victor's Lavender in Squim, Washington. And Victor, uh, my sister just planted a lavender farm in Southern Oregon, and she bought a lot of plants from Victor's. And we went up there, we've met Victor. Um, he's just a terrific guy, great healthy plants too. So those are two really, really good resources. Uh, Victor's Lavender in Swim, Washington, or Mike People at Red Rock Lavender Farm in Concho. Great. Next question comes from Joe in Prescott. She's got a good wind variety lavender and not getting a good bloom. Full sun, but not blooming. What, what do you think could be going on? Um, let me see if I can find this here. I'm sorry, is that the Prescott question? Yes. Okay, um, good one. I don't know the good one variety, um, so I can't tell you about the blooming. Um, I really apologize, but I don't know anything about good one. You know, the sun, I doubt that the sun is, is, is too hot in Prescott. You know, we're at 55, 77, 100 feet. I think you're probably that, or maybe even a little bit higher. We have a lot of plants in full sun here at the farm. You know, at least half, three quarters of our plants are in full sun. So I don't think that that's the issue. I would, I would look more towards um, whether or not the alkalinity and the water, are you getting yellow on the leaves? There's a whole lot of other things. Please feel free to shoot me an email 
and I'll consult with uh, my personal expert, my husband. <laughs> so give me an email at pinelavenderfarm at gmail.com and take a little picture, please, before you do your email and send us a, a photo of what your, what your plants look like wherever they're planted in and uh, let us have a look at that. And if we can, we'll answer for you. All right, well, good luck on that. Um, you have your Yavapai Master Gardeners who can also help out in Prescott. Um, also, one more thing, please follow me on Instagram. It's Instagram at Pine Lavender Farm or Facebook at Prime Pine Lavender Farm. And that's where I will update all of the information about when we're gonna open again, if I have any special deals, and when I am doing any special events, I'll always do that to Instagram and Facebook. And so you can keep up with us there, plus a lot of great pretty pictures. And we've got another question from Steve. How does lavender work as a container plant? In the chat box. Um, we, this has gone, been great because if we finally got, uh, if Terry's kind of got stuck here, uh, we made it through the whole presentation, so I'm real happy. I'm going to put up a poll for people who remain here and hopefully we get Terry back on. Terry, you can call me on the phone too and we can continue that way. Um, but if you're still on there, please take some time to answer that poll for me. Oh, launch it. And uh, while I've got that up, I'm going to share another slide here. Here I've got Terry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And um, I've shared in the uh, chat box this link for the survey. Really appreciate your help with that. I'm getting people responding to a to a poll here to see how they heard about it and many people got this email forwarded to them and uh, some people are answering in the other col column so if you mention in the chat box what your other was I can use that too um, just a little heads up for next week uh, I've got Dr. Lauren Perinsky, who's a research ecologist at the USDA Ag Research Service in Fort Collins. They've done research on something they call green stripping and grazing for cheatgrass. And uh, the red brome that we've been having a problem with our wildfires here in Southern Arizona and starting fires in the desert and then ripping over the mountains with a, with a bushfire. Um, strategy that they're using for working on that cheatgrass. I don't know if it'll be useful for our red brome, but I think we'll just have that discussion, try to look at ways that we can deal with fire. Um, that I saw another little query come through about lavender and containers. Please answer that. So I'll take a second to answer that question. So lavender does extremely well in containers. Um, our plants in the field probably have a, I don't know, 15 to sometimes even 20 year lifespan. Lavender in containers probably don't have that kind of a lifespan, but nevertheless, they do well in containers. You just keep those rules in your memory at all time. So if you're gonna plant a container, make sure you're gonna do a really, really great job of having super well-drained conditions, lots of rocks on the bottom or whatever you need, depending on the size of the container, and um, have sand, decomposed granite, something that will really provide a real drainage component to your soil conditions. The soil that you use, if you can, Try and get a soil that doesn't contain a tremendous amount of humus in it. Something that is going to, um, you know, I see a lot of those bag soils that are essentially pure compost, things like that. Just try to make sure that you've got enough sand or drainage material mixed in that you're going to really, really let those um, 
um, those lavender roots spread out well in the soil, but not sit in soggy soil. And those are really, really the only rules for uh, lavender in containers, and they move around easy. So if they're out in the sun during the day or, or evenings and things on your patio, and then you wanna bring them to a shade porch when the sun gets really hot, they kinda like that too. So um, I hope that answered your question about containers. And then I saw another question pop up about lavender and rabbits. So uh, referring back to Mike Teeples from Red Rock Lavender, he told us that he actually sells a lot of lavender plants to organic truck farmers, vegetable farmers in California and other of the big breadbasket states. They use them as live fences planted very close together. And it's really something that we have noticed here at our farm too, and that the critters like the gophers and the rabbits just don't like to penetrate through those lavender plants. Every now and then I'll see a bunny run through our lavender field, but he's hightailing for someplace else. So um, I think that if it's a very, very, very viable option for your vegetable garden, if you're being plagued with rabbits, to do a real tight planting of lavender on the perimeter to help you with that. And then I had another question about going more deeply into the irrigation system. So we have a 10,000 gallon tank here, buried tank, and we direct fill that tank from our Pine Creek uh, ditch. So Pine Creek at certain times of the year gets diverted into a pipe and then sent down that pipe. Historically, it was an open ditch, but now it's a pipe. And to the various original, I don't know, there's just a few dozen um, recipients of that water were one of them. And so we fill directly out of that pipe or ditch into our 10,000 gallon tank. We have a large one horse submersible pump. We bring it up. We're lifting quite a bit from our tank up to our upper field. We divided our field into four stations and we uh, each station goes through four different stages of filtration to just make sure that we keep the lines clean. It's not that there's anything contaminants in the water, we just want to make sure that all the emitters are receiving water that doesn't have any kind of sediment in it that would clog the emitters up. We water traditionally Lavender takes a gallon per plant per week. But what we find in this hot weather is that that would be really detrimental to stick by that generalization for watering lavender. Um, and again, we have really well-drained soil. So right now during this excessive heat, we are watering, everything gets watered twice a week and it's getting at least a gallon, probably more like two gallons on each of those waterings. Um, we use emitters and slit tape with, now with our field so long, um, we use emitters that are every 12 inches. And we kind of like that system, even though most of our plants are separated about three feet apart for our large plants like Grosso and Provence. And for the smaller, the English varieties like Royal Velvet on 24 inch centers. And I just saw something else, but it came and went, something about Lake Havasu. Can that come back again to me, that question? Chris, do you see that question, something I about do. 570 and feet? It's just, will lavender grow or need shade down okay. in? Um, Elevation is 575, Lake Havasu, a lot of days, triple digit. You know, Steve, I got to tell you, um, I don't know very much about lavender in those kinds of conditions, but I will tell you that um, Mike um, would be a great person to call again at Red Rock Lavender. I'm sorry, I don't have his phone number, but it's Mike Teeples. You can search Red Rock Lavender in Concho, Arizona, and he can probably direct you to the right varieties that would be the most successful. I know that we hear and have talked to several in the um, U.S. Lavender Association that the Spanish varieties, Shreotas, are the lavenders that they recommend for really, really hot um, 
really, really hot conditions. So you might want to consider Spanish lavenders and you can talk to Mike or your local nursery about that. Now, the only thing about Spanish lavenders I want to make sure I, I tell you is that some of the research being done with Spanish lavenders, if, it's ta if they're taken internally, they, they can become not a very friendly plant to your system. So if you're cooking with lavender, making lavender teas, making lavender in a way that you're going to take it internally, which is wonderful, stay away from the Spanish lavenders. And then I got another quick question about what varieties of lavender do well in containers. Um, I, think, I think I would start with something like Grosso. Grosso is a really pretty lavender, kind of navy blue. Well, actually, the picture of Chris. He is sitting remarkably in a place that looks very much like our farm. And he's sitting in a field of Grosso lavender plants. So you can see how beautiful, how tall those are. Um, Chris probably smells great right now. <laughs> and um, and you, I can even see some bees and butterflies in there too. But, but Grosso is a, a really attractive plant. Tends to have, I think, a lot of uh, adaptability. Again, you're going to want to get a nice big pot for this plant because it is going to get big, you know, three feet um, by about its third year. So uh, I think I would start there. Unless you have a nursery close by that recommends something different based on your microclimate and conditions. Uh, yeah, I noticed that Home Depot, Tractor Supply, in the spring, they all seem to bring in lavender plants. Uh, what you won't see on them is varietal information. It'll just say lavender. Usually it's lavangela, which is most of the time an intermediate. And, you know, if you're just doing it for ornamental purposes, that's just a fine plant to use. Thank you so much, Terry. I'm going to take this time to uh, close down our talk. Um, this has been a pleasure. And uh, thanks for you, everybody, for sticking with us through the presentation. I'm going to turn this off now, and uh, we'll see you next week.